guys very good afternoon again welcome back after a good break i hope you guys have enjoyed our first session of aditya and actually a panel discussion as well so moving onward to the next lab session uh, from ramya and sai so ramya is actually holding 18 years of experience uh, like she is a veteran of an it industry uh, specialized in performance and resilience engineering and sai along with that uh, he is a thought leader published international uh, international uh, internal white papers and have spoken into leading uh, software testing conferences at later st- uh, quality engineering trends so ramya and sai both are currently associated with lti that's lnd infotech and uh, they would be having a lab session on the no hows in re- resilience and reliability testing for building an anti fragile and highly scalable system So guys, uh, I would like to uh, hand over you, and uh, the stage is all yours. Over to you. Sure. Uh, sure. Thank you, Karthik. Let me share my screen. Yeah. Hope it is visible. Are we good? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karthik. Uh, and thank you, ATA, for this wonderful opportunity. It's been interesting sessions since yesterday, and I'm sure. each one of you would have been having the same great time like me like both of us me and sai so thank you so with that note let's get started so basically we are in the era where we feel everyone everyone understands and appreciates the need for nfr compliance in order to deliver a successful it system considering the complexities of the 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 exponential complexities i should say that considering the exponential technical complexities involved in the modern cloud native distributed containerized applications just doing performance testing isn't enough right so now having a concrete strong focus on resilience and reliability testing beyond performance testing is the need of the r in order to deliver and sustain an it system that is anti fragile highly scalable and meets customer expectations join with us let's discuss the know how in resilience and reliability testing here is the agenda so we start with covering the foundation topics setting the stage for first 20 40 minutes which includes a demo using one of the open source chaos engineering tool followed by the actual crux of the proposed solutions what we would like to share you from our experience that how or what does it take to build and deliver a best in class resilient and reliable application followed by a demo and case study after which we will open for quiz and question and answer session okay so this is a quick agenda for this uh, workshop now let's get started with the session but before that because it's post lunch we are right after uh, our heavy uh, meal so let me uh, take a quick break to request all of you to take this quick poll so would request all the audience to join slido.com and use this access code to take up couple of questions before we continue the section 1 So here you go. Let me give a couple of more seconds for all of you to join. Access slido.com. It will be something like this. You enter the participant code three six two three seven nine and hit the join me button. We are good. Okay. So with that, let's start the first poll. Which of the below statement about resilience and reliability testing is true from your perspective? team please go ahead and give your answers okay so now we could see okay good that's interesting we have got audience who think okay that's good so now i think i i me and sai have a bigger responsibility to ensure which is the right answer for, for this question by end of the session we have to ensure or we will assure we all make you comfortable to take up uh, to get a very good understanding about resilience and reliability testing friends uh, the option 1 what do you see here 
application needs to be resilient in order to meet the reliability goals for enhancing customer experience. That's the right answer because resilience testing is uh, to validate the uh, system to withstand failures and reliability testing is uh, helping to validate the customer expectations. It's the other way around. So the first is the right answer. Moving on to the second question. Does AWS and Azure have its own cloud native chaos engineering solution? I'm going to give another two more seconds. OK, that's the right answer. Yes, AWS has FIS fault injection simulator and Azure has the uh, Azure Chaos Studio. So these cloud service providers, they do offer their own uh, uh, chaos engineering tool and not necessarily we need to use uh, their respective uh, solutions. We do have opportunities. We can use the commercial and open source variety of tools that we have in the market, right? Last question. Which of the below metric best refers to IT system reliability? Is it concurrent users or availability, transaction response time or data volumes? OK, we'll give it another two more seconds before we move on. OK, cool. So I think we have got two answers or equally 50% uh, for each of the option. The right answer is availability. Basically, if we look at concurrent user load, this metric is primarily looked at as my uh, scalability aspect, but reliability is all about uh, uh, how do I meet the commitment what I have given in terms of availability to the best extent? So the best metric what is referent, uh, which is uh, uh, having a direct correlation with system reliability is availability. OK, so with that, I think it's time. Let's uh, go back to the uh, session. We'll start with uh, section one, which will set the strong foundation. And by then, I think uh, we, we should be prepared enough to get on to the actual crux of the topics. OK, so now what is resilience? So we have seen uh, thanks to the some of the speakers who touched upon some of the topics for the foundational topics. So I think we can do a very quick fast forwarding for section one because majority of these uh, basic foundations are already covered. So what is resilience? Resilience is the ability of a system to withstand and recover from failure and to resume its normal operation, right? So we all at this pandemic time, we all know uh, how resilient we were personally, so I don't need to explain it further. And resilience testing, it is a type of testing used to validate whether the system is fault tolerant. Is it anti-fragile? Is it having the capability to withstand failure and recover failure, right? When we look at reliability, it is all about what is the ability of the system to meet the promised commitments. I commit my customer telling the application will be highly available for 90% uh, or my response time commitment is less than two seconds, etc. So am I abiding to the commitment? So that is reliability. OK, so now what is reliability testing? So basically the type of testing that is used to validate whether the system continuously abides to the committed agreement, whether you commit on a particular uh, metric like availability or you have a variety of metrics which you have uh, uh, SLA has been defined. So reliability uh, testing, it's more of enhancing customer experience and enhancing the trust to build brand value for your uh, business. Any questions so far? I, I hear some noise, so I just wanted to check. Uh, Karthik, I uh, we are. I hope are, everything is okay. Uh, yes, uh, I would request everyone. Actually, the one who are not speaking can be on mute, and uh, probably if they, if there is any sort of questions, I would request participants to please uh, help us out with the questions in the chat box, and probably uh, either of one can take it up from there. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Karthik. Let's let's. So now we have seen what is the resilience and reliability. Now we need to understand very quickly. I'm sure you would know this by now with 
uh, uh, with good sessions uh, we have already attended. See, basically we are talking about making the system resilient and reliable. It means I'm making the system preparing the system to handle failures and I know what to expect in production or even if some problem comes, I know how to handle such failures, right? So end of the day by doing this, I reduce the number of incidents or I bring down the number of outages, right? And even if there is a problem, if even if there is a, a failure, there is a very quick way. I am prepared enough to fix a problem. So which means the time taken to fix a problem, which is MTTR is much lesser. And by doing this, yes, I help to make my system highly available and the system's uptime is high because I'm very much prepared to handle failures either in an automated way or if I have to handle manually, the time taken to fix a problem is much, much lesser because of my preparedness to handle or face failures. With doing all this, obviously I end up enhancing my customer experience, helping to maintain the trust the customer has on my brand, right? So hence resilience and reliability is very important. And now let me tell you this. Why do we say building an application highly resilient and reliable is much more increasingly difficult now than any time before? Right? So now we have been used to the monolith architectures always on prem deployed and all uh, the, the infrastructure was always on under our control, right? Gone are those days. And now we are talking about with the kind of digital transformations at scale, we are talking about every customer who's on cloudification journey or legacy modernization journey where they are uh, moving this, uh, the legacy applications to cloud native distributed containerized applications. By making this shift, there is a very high complexity and th there are more number of moving components in it. And there are more probabilities for failures because there are more components which are bringing together to make the entire IT system to work. And these components again, not necessarily uh, at the central place. These could be distributed across different multi cloud and with all that at one end and the velocity at which I make releases to production. Thanks to DevOps, it is a de facto culture and the number of releases have become uh, has exponentially increased and we are talking about multiple releases per day, right? So with that kind of a velocity being expected, how do we validate resilience and reliability of an application proactively, not pushing it to the right and ensure the application is highly sustainable. That's a million dollar question everybody has, right? So now let's get started. Let's see how chaos engineering can act as a lever for assuring IT resilience. If I look at resilience engineering, it's a broader engineering discipline that helps me to build a reliable application. Obviously, it helps me to build a, a adaptable anti-fragile application, right? And it is it is about the end to end, the bigger piece of uh, view, which means right from the design, how do I develop what strategies I bring into uh, at a code level or how do I validate and not just doing a stopping at release. I even move to the shift, right? How do I operate on an ongoing basis? How do I what kind of a strategies will help me to enable operational excellence? Thereby, I make the system adaptable to handle failures. That is the bigger chunk, the, the bigger umbrella, which is resilience engineering. And if you look at chaos engineering, it is a subset of resilience, which is primarily around this engineering discipline focuses on how do I inject failures and validate an IT system to measure the current resilience mechanisms implemented basically to validate where do the application stand? Is it is it meeting the expected uh, anti fragile characteristics defined or expected by the business or not? So that is the subset of resilience engineering, which predominantly uh, revolves around validation part of it. Now, when we look at it at a broader level, so chaos engineering is an extended journey that is especially required became too much of emphasizement came the moment we talked about distributed containerized applications, 
which is which was not the case earlier right the primarily because the way uh, everyone has to look at chaos engineering is it is not just about trying to break a portion of infrastructure to understand what is happening rather it is more of a very strategic scientific experimentation exercise which is done with a very clear objective which is done with a very clear purpose or hypothesis again what do you mean by hypothesis? So I know how the system is expected to work or I know how I measured how the system works in a particular steady state and I define a hypothesis. Say, for example, let me give you a quick example. If one of my easy to instance fails, there is no impact on my availability or no impact on my response time. The 90th percentile response time is always two seconds. So this could be a hypothesis. So I have to run an experiment to measure whether this hypothesis is met. How do I do it? I create inject uh, failures to bring down one of the EC2 instance. Assume there is a uh, three uh, instances are running in a cluster. So if I bring down whether the other two instances are able to manage the incoming load and doesn't bring down any, uh, they bring down the system. And at the same time, there is no uh, uh, issues in handling the response time because of the increase in load uh, is the other two uh, instances are able to handle and meet the availability and the response time uh, expectations, then the hypothesis is met. Then you are successful. If it is not, then obviously if you're not on auto scale, if there is no elastic load balancer in place, there's a chance that the hypothesis might not have passed. So you start focusing on how do you bring improvements to make this hypothesis true? So this is how a chaos engineering exercise is carried out. Right. So what we are doing in performance testing, if you ask me, have we not done any failure attacks? Were you not focused on trying to break the system as part of performance engineering? Yes, we did. It is not that we are. We, this is a new objective which we never had. We did. But if you look at performance as part of performance validation, we do have stress testing to trying to break the system beyond certain load conditions by injecting additional load. Etc. by bringing fa failing over one of the node or uh, DR testing all that. But the, the scientific experimentation way or the right way of uh, systematic way of planning it and exploiting it wasn't there when the focus was on the performance validation. So I would say chaos engineering helps me to go beyond performance engineering, helping me to carry out uh, injection or inject failures inside out wherein performance focuses on more of trying to break the system outside and by injecting additional load, right? So with that said, I think now we are very clear how do we uh, map chaos engineering and let's get started with how a chaos engineering strategy looks like. Sai, could you take this forward? Sai, are you there? So you able to hear me? Uh, I had some challenges yes. in unmuting. Okay, perfect. Okay. Is it now uh, okay? Hope you guys are able to see my screen. Um, okay. So thank you, Ramya, for uh, giving a quick introduction of uh, resilience engineering and chaos engineering, right? So, uh, so now we understand that chaos engineering is all about building immunity to your system, right? By by doing a failure injection. And how? What is the chaos engineering strategy? So this is a three-phased approach. Uh, which helps us in building and deploying a resilient application. So the first phase is all about building the hypothesis, right? That that Ramya talked about. So this is where we actually analyze the current uh, 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 current behavior of a stable system, baseline the performance, and then we determine what we call as the steady state behavior. Then we define the hypothesis, and um, we kind of you know uh, uh, we kind of assume that you know the system will sustain and comply with the service level objectives or service level uh, agreements that we define right for example you know uh, my system should respond um, within you know 2 seconds or you know my availab my availability should be 99.99% even during a chaos engineering attack right so this is this can help us to validate whether my system is resilient and whether it actually meets the hypothesis during this chaos injections and uh, this is the phase we also finalize the various failure attacks and the blast radius. Uh, blast radius is nothing but you know the intensity of uh, the system uh, getting impacted during a failure attack, right? So as a as a best practice, we generally start with a low blast radius, which means if if you're talking about uh, a distributed system, right? You bring down uh, one container or a couple of containers, 
uh, see how your system behaves and then gradually as your system matures, you kind of increase it to a higher blast radius like uh, bringing down on availability zone or bringing down the whole cluster and so on. So the second phase is more on the validate hypothesis. This is where the actual failure attack happens on the targeted environment. Uh, there could be uh, different kind of attacks like your resource level attacks like infrastructure network or uh, or the distributed level attacks, right? Like the Kubernetes attacks where you kill a pod, stop a pod and so on. Uh, and it is also very important to have an observability platform, right? So you cannot run your chaos engineering attack as a siloed uh, exercise. Uh, you might want to validate how it impacts your application business transactions or the KPIs that you want to monitor. So this is where a strong observability platform is required along with, uh, you know, when you run your chaos engineering test or your failure injection test. And the last one is uh, the remediate phase. This is where you actually compare your system behavior uh, of the steady state versus the uh, system behavior uh, during the chaos attacks and validate the hypothesis. And you also identify if there are any action items for remediation, right? For example, uh, if you have identified any single point of failures or uh, if you feel that you know there should be an auto scaling configuration that needs to be um, you know, configured in your system uh, so that whenever there are uh, containers that are killed you know it should be automatically spun up or a new nodes should be spun up you know so all these different configurations are uh, remediated and you know the chaos uh, or the failure injection attacks are run again to ensure that your system is indeed mature so some prevalent chaos engineering tools uh, as you might have known chaos engineering as a principle was um, pioneered by Netflix, you know, they had chaos monkeys and semen armies way back in 2010, uh, where when they moved some of their enterprise workloads from on-premises to cloud. Uh, now there are plethora of devices, I mean, plethora of tools, right, you know, which are available in the market, both open source and um, uh, and commercial, like Gremlin, uh, Litmus, and, you know, even the cloud platforms provide their own native uh, chaos engineering tools. So some of the gaps before we get into the demo, um, uh, some of the gaps that we see in the market uh, with the chaos engineering principles is generally uh, chaos engineering is a one-time reactive ritual, you know, which are done predominantly in the test environment, um, and only, only the low blast radius are typically run, right? Um, but what we also what we also see is, you know, as I said, uh, these are these are run as siloed exercise or you know indep independent exercises without really monitoring your application business transactions or the failure impact analysis so this is where uh, an observability platform is the need of the heart right so we will touch upon the observability platform you know what are the components that consist of your observability platform you know down the line before that you know let me quickly uh, get into a demo so this is not a lab session as such but you know i will walk you through on the steps that we have done Right. Uh, uh, the primary reason being that, you know, um, there is a cloud setup that we have done and it takes uh, a lot of time to provision. Right. So, so what we will show you is a detailed step on what we have done so that you can try this exercise offline. We will also share you the steps that we have followed, you know, so that you can go ahead and try it uh, at an offline mode. Okay. So the demo that we will use today is uh, an, is, an, is for an application called Sock Shop. Uh, some of you might have already heard. Uh, so Sock Shop is a microservices, um, uh, a, a cloud native application. So in this case, we have actually deployed it on cloud. Uh, so we will be actually injecting the chaos engineering attacks on this particular uh, Sock Shop or the Weave Socks application and find what is the impact that happens uh, on, on your application, right? So before that, you know, quickly, uh, so that everyone is on the same page, right? You know, I wanted to quickly demonstrate uh, some of the key concepts before we get into the... Um, uh, Sock Shop application. So as I said, this is a cloud native application. So this is actually running on a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, in this case, we are running it on AWS. Uh, so quickly to level set everyone, um, some of the key terminologies that we will use as part of this demo. Uh, number one is microservices. As you might have heard, uh, microservices is a suite of services, you know, bounded by business capabilities. So in case of Sock Shop uh, application, you know, uh, all your Functionalities are developed as microservices like your catalog, uh, carts, um, shipping, and so on. Um, and you know these are loosely coupled and independently deployable, right? For example, if there is a change in catalog functionality, I can go ahead and make the changes and independently deploy it and scale it. Uh, containers, which are the platforms which packages your microservices and all its dependencies. So Docker is a classic example of containers. You've got other containers like container T and so on. Uh, pods. Uh, pods in Kubernetes context is nothing but um, it's a group of one or more containerized services, right? Related containerized microservices, uh, 
together, you know, which are shared, which are uh, together with the shared storage and network resources. Uh, if, so if you see um, uh, the representation on the right, so this is your pod, and pod actually consists of you know multiple containerized microservices deployed with it, right? So your catalog uh, uh, container, your order container, your cars container, all are deployed within a single pod. A group of related containers are deployed within a single pod, and node are nothing but you know these are worker machines on which the pods runs. It can be a VM or a physical machine. So you have a node. And you know there could be multiple pods which are deployed within a node, right? And a cluster may have multiple nodes, right? And each node may have multiple pods, and each pod may have multiple containers deployed, right? And finally, Kubernetes, you know, this is your core engine, right? Which which is an open source container orchestration system. It automates the deployment, scaling, and management of the containerized microservices. Right? So what I mean is, uh, for example, you know, if I want to roll out a new version of um, catalog, right? There is an upgrade to my functionality, catalog functionality. Kubernetes can actually take care of provisioning this uh, um, uh, or deploying this container. Uh, to the latest version, it can roll out to a new version. It can take care of uh, spinning up additional nodes if required. You know, if there is a lot of user traffic, it can help in auto scaling. Uh, you know, all those uh, you know uh, centralized management can be uh, done by the your Kubernetes uh, uh, container orchestration system. And again, Kubernetes can be installed on any cloud platform, right? You know, it can be Google Cloud, Azure, or AWS, uh, the the plat cloud platform of your choice. So with this context, I will go ahead and uh, now create a quick attack. So this is the uh, um, lab guide, right? That you might want to try offline. Uh, so there is a list of prerequisite. You know, here we have used AWS. You can go ahead and use the cloud platform of your choice. Uh, what we have done here is basically you now we have set up some installation in terms of we have set up the cube CTL. We have spun up. Uh, we have created a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, then uh, we have installed this SOCSOP application, right? The the this application that you see here. Um, so basically, we have cloned a GitHub repository and created some namespace and um, basically installed this application. So this is pretty detailed, right? So you can actually go through this step by step guide, and you should be able to easily uh, set up this uh, application. And then second section is more of you know how do we set up this litmus litmus is our uh, chaos engineering tool that we will use for uh, injecting the failure scenarios here um, so this also talks about uh, how we have set up litmus uh, you know what configuration changes that you have to make and all those items um, so now i have set up litmus and sock shop uh, because of the lack of time uh, but i will go ahead and uh, you know start listing down some of the parts that is already available as part of this sock shop right so hope you guys are with me until now. So what I'm doing now is, as I said, pods are nothing but you know it 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 uh, has all the related microservices containers, right? So what I'm doing now is I'm listing down all the pods that are running for the sock shop application. Okay. So as you can see, I have a catalog pod, I have a catalog DB, I have a orders pod, I have a payment pod. So payment pod actually hosts all the uh, payment containers, right? Uh, or my catalog pod uh, has all my catalog related containers, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to inject uh, a network attack on this particular catalog pod so that catalog pod is blocked from all the incoming and outgoing traffic and the front end service will not be able to communicate to the catalog pod, so which means that the pod, the, the front end service will not be able to load the catalog data here. I hope you guys are with me. Right. So you can you can inject whatever attack you want. You know, you might want to possibly inject a, a, a pod delete attack, or you know, if you want to uh, if you want to uh, do a resource level attack, right? For example, a CPU spike on the node on which these pods are running, right? You can do a uh, varied list of attacks, but in this particular example, you know, I'm going to do a pod level attack. OK, so let me go ahead. So this is the front end of the uh, litmus, right? Again, I've, as I said, I've given you the steps of how do you, how do you install the litmus uh, within the same cluster. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to create an failure attack on this particular pod. 
So before that, you know, there's an agent uh, which runs on litmus. So Lidge agent is nothing but uh, this is actually the one which actually injects the failure attack on the specified pod, right? That we are going to mention. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new injection workflow. I'm choosing the agent which will inject this failure, right? I'm clicking on next. And um, what I'm doing here is, you know, I am actually taking a default experiment which is already available as part of my chaos hubs, right? So chaos hub uh, is a centralized repository which hosts different kind of failures. Right? For example, it could be a pod delete, it could be a pod network logs, network loss, you know, as in my example, uh, or it could be uh, spiking a CPU utilization or inducing network latency onto a node. You know, all those different experiments are by default available as part of the chaos service, right? And you can customize it based on your need. So in this case, I am actually doing a catalog uh, pod loss, right? This is what I'm doing here. I'm clicking on next. I'm adding a new experiment. You know, what is the uh, experiment that I want to add? So I'm going to add a generic pod network loss. And uh, I'm going to change some of the default configurations. Uh, I'm choosing the sock shop. This is my application. What pod I want to inject the network loss attack? It's a catalog pod. I click on next. You know, I, I leave out the default configuration access. So here in this case, you know, I am running the chaos duration for 60 seconds and I'm doing 100% packet loss, right? Which means uh, there will be no incoming or there will be no outgoing traffic on this particular pod, right? So basically your catalog container uh, or your catalog microservices will not work because it cannot communicate with your uh, front end service, which is your BeefSox front end service, right? And um, and which means that you know uh, when when the uh, front end service tries to communicate with the catalog pod, it is not going to give get any response, so it is going to um, display a blank catalog. Okay, and I'll just set the cleanup chaos resources as false because you know I want to debug it for my future purposes, and I'm assigning some weightage. Uh, if I have multiple experiments that I want to do, you know I can go ahead and uh, Assign some weightages uh, based on that, and I'm going to schedule it now, right? So view ML is basically, uh, you know, the configuration that we have just created. You can download it and use it for your data purpose. So what I've done is I've just scheduled uh, an attack, right? The first step is this is going to actually install the uh, chaos experiment basically the pod network loss attack on my cluster. Uh, and uh, once this is installed, you know, the agent will start injecting the pod network loss onto that specific catalog container. Okay, hope you guys are with me. Yes, I, we are there. Great question. Sure. So let me go ahead and go ahead and so as you can see now, right, the catalog is not loading, right? You know, you were seeing all the list of socks, which were actually um, uh, you were able to see it before. Now, when the chaos engineering attacks are done um, for the duration of sixty seconds. You will not be able to see any catalog that is being loaded. Right? So that's the attack that we have done on a specific uh, pod within the Kubernetes cluster. So a couple of key learnings or takeaways from this exercise, right? What we have done is number one, um, you. The first thing is, you know, there should have been multiple replicas for this catalog pod, right? Um, so even if one of my replica has has gone down the network traffic should have been ideally routed to another replica within the pod so that uh, my catalog would have still worked, right? So that's the first learning uh, that I see from this exercise. And the second learning is um, ideally, you know, if the catalog is not loaded, you know, the user should have been given a, a proper error message saying that uh, 
hey, you know, the, we are still loading the catalog service. Please try again later. You know, this does not give me a good customer experience. Right. So with this, I will hand it over uh, to um, Ramya to continue with the rest of the uh, slides. Ramya, you're on mute. So now, thanks, uh, Sai. So basically, we have seen about how do we inject failures and how do we validate the application for resilience, right? Now, what is reliability testing? So reliability, as I was speaking before, it is all about enhancing customer experience, enhancing customer, customer is king, right? So how do we do that? Definitely, this is not something uh, reactively we could manage. Rather, how do we proactively think about making customer happy. NFR compliance is very important, right? Uh, having clear non-functional requirements defined and complying primarily uh, performance and security, if you look at, defining it early, validating it early in the life cycle, not as an afterthought is very important for uh, enhancing uh, the customer expectation, right? Then there are a lot of SLA commitments. We we have penalty classes also added. The SLAs could be on availability, response time, and just look at RTO and RPO, the recovery time, whether we have any specific expectation from the business, or it could be uh, there could be a, a, a tolerance level for the acceptance on the data loss, RPO. Say, for example, if it is a banking client, obviously we cannot expect a data loss uh, of the, the uh, system going down and there is a loss of some uh, transaction that has happened for the last few minutes. No. So RPO has to be zero for a banking uh, uh, application compared to a, a different uh, internet application. It could be different. So there could be different SLAs and different compliances are defined and we, we share this with customers. So there should be a way to comply it, start thinking about early in the life cycle, explore how do we adhere it is very important. And as we were talking about resilience, ensuring the system is built to handle failures is very important to keep the system always available because available uh, reliability is primarily the expectation is my application is always available. So resilience is one way which helps me to make my application always available. And just by doing resilience engineering, if you ask me, can I meet uh, the, the reliability expectations? No, it is definitely one bigger chunk of how do I meet the reliability expectations of the customer, right? So how do I, what, what are the various metrics, yardsticks to measure reliability? I have metrics like mean time to failure, the, the day I start operating from how, what is the system uptime? From when onwards I start fa seeing failures, that is one of the metric. And mean time to detect a problem. Say for example, if you do not have an automated alerts configured, uh, the, the, uh, the the operational engineers have to monitor and get to know there is a problem that has happened, then there is a very good time that has uh, uh, been used up to even detect there is a problem that has happened, right? And once you detect that problem has happened, the mean time to repair is the time that we usually take to fix a problem. So ideally, having good practices of resilience and reliability testing, it end of the day helps me to reduce the mean time to detect and mean time to repair. And obviously the percentage availability, the time the system is, the uptime basically uh, can be improved. If I'm preparing the system to face failures and I'm prepared enough to handle it to recover at no time, right? As we all know, the key measurement is the availability. So availability is nothing, but it is always represented as five nines. It is a percentage is the metric that is used. And we all know this is a five nines. It's very popular. So it is nothing, but it is the time, the underlying system and it's all the subcomponents are expected to be operational to meet its expected purpose, right? So what does this five nine mean? If I have to relate it in a unit of time, just imagine it is 5.2 minutes of downtime per year. It is it is not per day, it is per year, right? So if I have to, if I have a commitment to my end customer, this is the availability, I will build a system and I will sustain it, then just imagine what level of resilience and reliability assurance uh, practices has to be in place and automation has to be in place to handle and meet this SLA, 
right? So now, what, what are the general challenges? If you look at, we all know this general problems, the, the, the siloed working of development and operation team, and there is no clarity on what is happening the other side of the wall. All these general problems, I agree to an extent, uh, not to an extent, to a greater extent with DevOps coming as a de facto culture, DevOps addresses these problems of siloed working where operation team is being uh, worked in the pressure, blamed for um, ensuring the system is not reliable, etc. But if you look at DevOps brings beautiful principles um, to break the silo, to increase uh, the productivity, making agility, all that. But do you agree if I say DevOps doesn't really emphasize or uh, give a principle um, on ensuring system reliability, that is when you need you have challenges. So even in a DevOps environment, there is no emphasizement on ensuring system reliability. There is no specific uh, principle. How do you ensure? How do you prioritize? So that is where the challenge and the need of the R. End of the day, we want a cultural change. The delivery culture should accept failure and we need to be prepared to face failure and fail fast is the only way we can ensure we start early do continuously prepare ourselves before we push things uh, to the right side, right? So having stringent practices at shift lift is the only mantra through which we do not need to wait till the entire system is ready or pushed it to production for all these thoughts to come through. Start early and do continuously take it all the way to shift right. So that is the need of the hour, okay? That I think we have given um, enough details on resilience and reliability testing. Now let's look like uh, let, let's look at how do we really succeed to make this really happen. So here are the success ingredients if we look at to deliver a best in class, a reliable and resilient application. Okay, first and foremost, smart balancing of shift left and shift right. Resilient and reliable testing activities is very important. Just doing a silo, just focusing on early uh, bringing the testing early or just focusing uh, after moving it to operations phase, it will not help. So there needs to be a smart balance and marrying uh, has to happen, right? Moving on to the second secret ingredient. Without having the power of observability, these different set of personas, which are the set of personas at uh, the shift left and the personas who deal with the operations without having a common continuous powerful observability these uh, two different variety of personas cannot bring together all their expertise to make this a possibility okay so third just by ensuring we have enough proactive practices throughout the uh, software development life cycle while i design and build and release it it will not be enough. So that is where you need a strong site reliability engineering principles to be made available in order to ensure the application is highly scalable and it meets the customer expectations. We touched upon what is smart balancing. Do you think by just by bringing shift left and shift right testing practices, we will be able to solve this problem of resilience and reliability? No, unless we define very stringent quality gates unless the application is created, developed, designed, or I would say baked in for these characteristics. We cannot just by bring, bringing testing, we cannot make these things happen. At least, yes, I agree and reactively we test it and yes, we understand these validations fail and we are not ready. That reactively we get to know, but just by doing uh, shift left and shift right testing practices, we cannot solve the problem. That is when if you look at shift left practices, start with having very good focus on defining the NFR, defining the SLAs that we have to uh, meet the customer expectation. And moving to looking at the architecture and design, which is very, very important, which is always taken for granted uh, majority of the time, unless there is a process defined for it. The architecture has to be refined, uh, reviewed for the high availability architectural constructs. And not just that, there are a variety of design patterns like <clears throat> be it with bringing circuit breakers or are we having a fallback or it could be the bulkhead pattern. So there are a variety of resilience patterns that has to be thought through 
and these architectural constructs has to be reviewed before even we move ahead with uh, the the uh, checking through getting onto the code. And again, when it comes to a code level best practices and then are from the early sprint, start focusing on an API level or a component level. What is available? See what best can be done from a performance engineering, bringing early performance engineering, bringing early chaos engineering and do it continuously as part of the pipeline. That is very important. And not waiting for the entire system to be ready to make all this. Do not wait for carrying out, say, bringing down the entire availability zone, bringing down the entire Kubernetes cluster, right? Start at a container level. See what happens, how, how gracefully a service is able to handle a failure if I can inject a memory issue on a particular container, right? So it could start with a very low blast radius without expecting for the entire system. Then move your focus towards uh, bringing a uh, high end high blast radius experiments okay so this is all about the the shift left activities that has to be in place and if you look at the the shift right this persona is primarily about bringing the wisdom of production to the product engineering team right so that is the core objective and this is the uh, 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 area where there is a very strong focus on bringing alerting policies in place and ensuring the SLAs are defined so that there is a continuous way of monitoring on an ongoing basis. I don't really look at where do I stand on an SLA on a monthly, quarterly basis just for a reporting purpose, right? Make it continuous on an ongoing basis. Am I abiding to the SLA what I committed? Is If my target is, say, meeting uh, uh, availability of, say, 99% on a day-to-day -day basis, am I looking at, am I uh, abiding to that availability? How do you measure it? So that is an important focus that this shift right practices has to bring in and not just monitoring your SLAs and SLO will solve the problem. So you need to really focus on how do you bring automation. So there will be a lot of opportunities of toil. There is a lot of technical depth in the system and there is a lot of uh, uh, toil, which is a manual uh, non value creating activity. So it is the responsibility to see what can be automated, right? So and, uh, maybe a quick example could be see if you have a deployment automation, see if you have an infrastructure as a code, see if some of the incidents, the repetitive incidents, which you see, you group it, you analyze it, can you come up with an automated way of handling such incident? So when that incident happens again, you do not need to spend time on the call. Rather, instead you focus your more time on taking up an engineering activity to bring some automation and envision to get onto a zero touch ticket resolution. So have an aspirational SLOs. All that is possible just if you start early and start focusing on bringing automation, so you have room to do chaos engineering, you have room to bring efficiency to the system. And just by shifting it left and shifting it right will not solve the problem unless you have both the practices smartly balanced and that's when the continuous observability is going to help you. And observability, if you look at, it is it is an attribute or a key characteristic of a system, right? With If I look at, the internal state uh, of a system. If a system is able to expose its internal state by a variety of metrics, then the system can be called it as highly observable. And these external outputs, which could be metrics, logs, events and traces are the ones which are actually helping me to examine those and then identify what is internally happening, right? So just imagine a, a, a several thousand microservices are running in a, a containerized environment and you do not have observability, then it becomes very tough for understanding if there is a failure, where do the development uh, uh, folks will go and fix a problem? Where do, how do I ensure the, the root cause analysis time is uh, reduced in order to meet my availability target. So observability is a characteristic which is expected as a property expected by the system in order to have a observability solution, a powerful full stack observability solution, which brings capability to monitor that kind of a system. And if you look at full stack observability, it is a it, it is a tool which has capability to do a real time uh, uh, monitoring, collecting the data across different uh, server components to get in depth visibility across different dimensions, right? So that I'm prepared enough to troubleshoot and reduce the root cause analysis time taken to 
to quickly come up with a fix, right? So that is the whole objective of bringing a powerful full stack observability tool. And if you look at the tool, it is not just about giving network or infrastructure health metrics. It also provides very good insights at a code level, at a query level, what is happening and bringing together all the logs that be it at a cloud, a different server component. There are a variety of logs that is being pushed up by different components. So bring together all this, have a correlated view of bringing together all these data because it is it is simple if it is a monolith application running on a SOA architecture, but in a distributed environment, manually doing this, it, it is it is not going to make the expectations come true, right? So we are on a very big dream of meeting 99.999% availability. And if the time taken to fix a problem is so high, then definitely that goes as a dream, right? So not just with these insights, correlation dashboards, you also have to have a very good view of what is happening at an end user level. What is the browser level performance metrics? That is the real user monitoring capability comes in and synthetic monitoring, scheduling uh, automated uh, uh, scripts to run at a particular point of the uh, time and then measuring where do I stand, whether the so critical business transactions or meeting the service availability targets, etc. Beyond all this dimensions, there is one dimension again it also needs to give me a good insights to do a correlation in the hierarchy. How many alerts have been created? How many incidents have been triggered, right? So all this has to be proficient by my full stack observability, without which I think it will it will stay as a monitoring tool, which just helps me to look at certain metrics. But observability is beyond monitoring tool where I have the capability to troubleshoot a problem if there are any failures, right? From a Basically, if you look at monitoring, there are plethora of metrics that has to be monitored. And if if Google says, uh, if not everything, at least four key things that you have to monitor. That is your servicing time, error rate, volume of the request, what you get at any point of time, and your resource saturation. So these are very primitive, the golden signals that at least you can use to um, uh, measure where do you stand with respect to the application internals, right? So what do you think uh, how this full stack observability tool as such it has evolved? Uh, yes, Ramya. So in my view, uh, as we have seen, observability is measuring the system's current state, you know, based on the various traces, right? You know, it could be your logs, it could be um, uh, your matrices, you know, uh, traces and so on. So, so given that uh, observability platform definitely helps an organization to quickly diagnose and you know get to the root cause of the performance bottleneck right so for example if a particular business transaction has serious implications on performance right and with as you said with thousands of microservices that are running how do i quickly nail down which particular microservice or which particular component is actually causing the problem and that's where the power of observability platform comes in and the observability platform can also give you an end-to-end -end visibility across your application stack you know which can help you to identify and fix the problems even before it can make a critical impact to your business SLAs and ensure that it does not hamper your customer experience, right? And what we've seen is over the years, uh, the, the platform, the observability platforms have matured from more of a descriptive analytics, right? You know, just reporting what the system matrices are to more of a prescriptive analysis on how can you predict the anomalies or how can you uh, ensure that you know there is an automated resolution of uh, th these issues uh, by uh, looking at your historical tracing data and you know applying machine learning algorithms on top of it and and try to predict these anomalies beforehand before it even happens absolutely agree sai yeah it has evolved so much and i don't even remember this word existed uh, uh, 3 4 years back right so it's, it's it has a uh, uh, we, we never we always used to use monitoring tools in production and the power of observability is being understood in the last recent years. Agree. Okay, let's move on to the third secret ingredient. We started with the first and second we finished and now site reliability engineering, right? So site reliability engineering is all about creating value. It is all about creating value to your end customer, right? So now how do I create a value? It is like, what is that I have committed? And am I on an ongoing basis monitoring and abiding to what is my uh, committed level? And if not, am I taking the right precautionary actions to, to move on, to make some improvement, right? So as simple as that. So now from a Google's um, way of looking at it, 
it is all about applying engineering software engineering principles to solve all the infrastructural operational problems but if you look at in the in the traditionally in the past infrastructural problems operational issues are majority of the things are manually done with a very big l1 l2 l3 team it's all there is no automation but with with this perspective coming in majority of the uh, problems that an infrastructural or operational level what we have been dealt it is all brought under control with the power of engineering interventions right so now i'm sure you would have heard about this um, watermelon um, effect so at a quick look everything looks green but if you look at inside there are other, i mean it isn't the case right so primarily having right site reliability engineering principles is very much essential just to get rid of these problems so at a quick look everything so you are meeting you you feel like you have met the customer experience just because you you had your own checklist i did yes a b c and d but it it the, there is a the, the prevalent watermelon uh, 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 i mean effect that happens right so now site reliability engineering it brings certain list of principles it it is uh, it under this principles definitely uh, predominantly it is on SLA, SLO management, and then very focused effort for engineering and reducing the toil. Bring automation as a lever to ensure more focus is available to improve the resilience and reliability because you bring efficiency by automating, not making the team very busy, just handling incidents, right? As uh, it is uh, like uh, interpreted like that, right? So now it is, if you ask me, is it all about just SLA and toil management uh, automation? No. There is need to be a strong focus on doing a continuous um, the chaos engineering. So unless you have all these basic principles ready, you will not have enough time for the team to really focus on resilience. How do I bring efficiency in terms of uh, bringing performance improvement or forecasting and then provisioning the right capacity, meeting my cost expectations, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So these are the principles that has to be driven under the site reliability engineering and basically it goes like this. So if you look at the feature velocity is something which is very important. So the, the kind of the quick time to market strategies push me to increase the velocity of releases, pushing new features to the production, right? And uh, though DevOps helped me to bring together the teams, so it, it uh, stopped or uh, removed the siloed working style. But unless I bring a principle through error budget, which is driven under S um, uh, SRE, I will not have a solid focus on ensuring system reliability. And I have an equal focus on both of it, just using one single uh, yardstick, which is error budget. So. Let me quickly explain you what is uh, SLA uh, for you to uh, understand what is error budget. So SLA is something I, I'm, I'm the product vendor, so it is a commitment which I agree with the uh, with the client, with the customer. That is SLA. So I commit to my customer as a product vendor. Uh, I will ensure the application I built will be 99.9% .9 available. What is SLO? To my internal product product engineering team, I need to have a stringent a set a much more stringent target. So what is the target I internally have to design a system is SLO, which means it is much more stringent. For example, now the availability SLO, what I set internally to my team will be 99.999%. So even if the team doesn't meet the expectation, there are some discrepancies i still have enough room and my still my customer commitment what i committed is just 99.9 percent .9 i'm able to meet it right so now what is sli you have a goal you have agreed on a target how do you measure it say i can measure my availability by monitoring the success rate of my http requests so now if i monitor it say i get a uh, hundred K uh, uh, request during an hour that that is the time window I'm measuring the availability. So 99.9% .9 availability of uh, for this hundred K, which refers to hundred requests can fail, wherein the rest all has to be available. It has to have a uh, success, 
Uh, but if you look at SLO, it is 99.999, which means out of 100k request, one request can fail out of 100k request. That is the SLO, which is much more stringent. And what is the error budget now? The room I have to fail. So I have I can fail one time. So out of 100k requests I have got, one request can fail during that one hour time frame when I get 100k requests, right? So the error room is what is the error budget. Now, if you look at your error budget and if you have already used it, then you don't push, you don't focus pushing the new releases to production. Rather, focus, bring focus to improvise the system reliability. So this is taken care on priority. But you are the the you are able to meet the target and you are absolutely doing good and you have not even touched the error budget room. What you have to fail, then you still continue focusing on feature velocity and start taking the new releases to production. So in this way, SRE comes up with a predefined principle. How do I monitor on an ongoing basis what I commit to my customer, what the internal project um, you know, the product engineering team are uh, working for a target and what it decides, what factor decides whether I should focus on system reliability or velocity of the releases. OK, so this is how site reliability engineering brings me a lot of focus on the shift most right part of it. So during operations after moving the system, uh, I mean uh, to make a decision whether I need to push new releases to production or maintain the system reliability, improvise it on the version which is already running in production. So this is managed by site reliability engineering principles. So if we look at the tool sets of SRE, it is quite wide. Sai, do you want to just get started with how does it look like what what kind of uh, uh, tool sets and sre which should need to be comfortable sure um, so as you rightly said ramya you know one of the major goals for sre is to uh, automate the toil right that's one thing and ensure that your application is reliable for the end customer right so in this context sres are expected to be proficient um, at least knowledgeable you know in in wide variety of tools uh, it could be our monitoring tools like you know the APM tools like App Dynamics, Dynatrace, and so on, like the synthetic monitoring and infrastructure monitoring tools. Uh, monitoring tools essentially can help you to uh, uh, kind of pinpoint you know uh, the performance bottleneck in your entire application architecture, right? Uh, and the incident and on-call management basically helps you to um, manage your production incidents and you know help you to resolve and communicate them to the stakeholders. And finally, the configuration management uh, tools. Uh, you've got a lot of tools in the market like Ansible, Puppet, etc., which can help you to uh, spin up, you know, provision and manage uh, the on-demand infrastructure, and you know, bring up your application uh, through automation. Right. So these are the wide variety of tools that the SRE is expected to know. Uh, but it's not just you know being aware of all these tools, right? How can an SRE Kind of correlate the data from these different tools and provide and contextual analytics, right? That's more important. For example, um, say you know there is a, a failure, there is an intermittent failure of payment transactions uh, in my production, and you know there is an incident which is logged, say in service now. Uh, so the SRA looks at the uh, uh, service now incident. He finds that it, okay, there is an intermittent failure in the payment transaction. So he goes to the APM tool, and he kinds of debugs and, and understands that uh, a particular message queue is actually causing the performance bottleneck right and now he wants to dig it further kind of understand what is what is happening in this message queue right so he looks at the log analytics tool kind of gets the logs from from this uh, uh, message queue container also look at the infrastructure monitoring tool uh, and, and understands that you know the message queue uh, is kind of overloaded and it's kind of crashing every time. So that's where you know he needs to make a decision that you know uh, how can I have a multiple replica of the message queue containers, right? So these are some of these decisions that he makes um, by correlating the data and applying the contextual analytics. Uh, it, it's not just being aware of all these different tool capabilities. It's how you apply the analytics on top of it and and drive the resolution. That's more important. Absolutely, yeah. It, it's more about having correlated insights and doing analytics. Absolutely, sir. So uh, let me quickly switch back to my screen um, for the second demo, All right? Um, 
so let's let's continue with where we have left earlier right so to quickly recall uh, we had uh, injected uh, a chaos engineering attack on our um, sock shop which is the weave socks uh, front end servers uh, if you recall uh, there were these were the list of ports that were running and we had injected a network loss on this specific pod which is catalog pod and if you recall you know the catalog pod was not was not uh, loading and now since the chaos experiment was now completed I should be able to see the catalog pod, you know, the catalog uh, services being up and running again, right? So doing the siloed experiment, you know, doesn't make sense, right? So what if, so what is the inference that I'm getting once I um, uh, do this chaos attack or the failure injection, right? Um, although, you know, I, I was able to gather a couple of key learnings, right? One is how can I have multiple replicas of catalog pods so that uh, even if one catalog pod fails, the traffic is still routed to another catalog pod, you know, which can still um, kind of, you know, talk to the front end servers and load the catalog information. And the second learning that we saw was, you know, how can I, uh, uh, how can I have the user being uh, provided with uh, uh, a better uh, error message right so that you know it doesn't hamper the user experience so this is these are where the couple of learnings that we uh, learned so what i'm going to do is how can i bring in the the power of observability right uh, so when i run this chaos engineering experiment how can i look at my application business transactions or you know how can i look at my uh, how can i look at the impact of uh, the chaos engineering attacks on my different pops right you know that's what we are going to look at now so what I'm going to do is, you know, I'm just going to save uh, this um, this attack, whatever that we did, uh, as a template so that I can reuse it. I need not go through all the configuration again. Uh, just clicking on save changes. So the template is now applied so that I can go and reuse this template again for a different workflow. What I'm going to do is again, I'm going to select the agent which is going to inject the attack. So what I'm going to do now is, you know, inject the same attack again and kind of monitor its impact on the various different services of my sock shop application um, uh, in, in the Grafana and Prometheus dashboards, right? So what I've also set up right now is a Prometheus and Grafana dashboard, a, a Grafana dashboard and uh, a, a Prometheus data source. Uh, within the same cluster. So let me quickly show you what I've done. So I've created a, another namespace called monitoring. Where I have set up Grafana and Prometheus. So what Prometheus actually does is it gets the data from um, the chaos, the litmus uh, containers, right? So I will also show you the list of litmus containers that are running so these are my chaos exporter and chaos operator right so this the chaos operator is the one which is actually injecting the uh, uh, this is the agent which is actually injecting the chaos uh, uh, bringing down the uh, pod or you know uh, inducing the network traffic on this pod uh, there is also the different experiments that we have run right so it is all saved in the uh, within the same uh, namespace and what i'm actually doing right now was uh, um, this this catalog, sorry, this litmus. Um, just a minute. So what I'm doing right now is, you know, this chaos exporter actually sends the uh, injection failure injection data to Prometheus, and from where you know I am actually displaying the uh, information on the uh, impact of this failure injections onto my Grafana dashboard, right? So that's what I'm going to do now. So again. As I said, in all this setup, you can actually view it in the um, the setup that I've given here. Uh, so what we have done till now is the section one and section two. Um, uh, the section three is where we look at the observability dashboard using Grafana and Prometheus. Uh, I've given we've given the detailed steps on how do we configure them, and this is exactly the steps that we have followed here to bring this uh, bring this up. Okay, so going getting into Prometheus. So let me quickly inject this chaos engineering attack. So in this case, I'm going to uh, use the existing template that I've just created now, and I should be able to directly um, inject the attack. So 
So what is it going to do now is again, it is going to. Uh, hit this particular catalog pod and it is going to apply the network outage on this particular pod so that uh, my front end put service will not be able to load the catalog service, right? So this will take a little bit of time because it is going to inject the attack. It's the same process that we do, right? So meanwhile, what I can do is I can switch to my Prometheus dashboard. So Prometheus, as you know, you know, it's, it's just the data source uh, uh, which your litmus actually, you know, sends in the various failure injection data directly to Prometheus. And uh, for example, you know, what kind of data it sends, for example, you know, uh, an experiment data, right? For example, when I started the experiment, when I completed my risk experiment is one kind of data that it sends. It sends a lot of data. So when I type on litmus, you can see uh, how many failed experiments I have, you know, how many past experiments I have, uh, all those different data, you know, I can actually uh, look at. And it also sends me a lot of data around uh, HTTP request, right? Uh, how many HTTP sessions are active? How many HTTP sessions are uh, idle? You know, all those different information you can get it from um, from Prometheus. So I switched to Grafana. Grafana is just a visualization tool which takes the data from Prometheus and it displays it uh, in the visual dashboard. So as you can see, now the chaos engineering attacks have started, right? So this is my catalog uh, service, right? And this is my average response time of the catalog service. And this is the latency that I measure for my catalog, right? And, you know, I can also configure for uh, other uh, services as well, like by payment, shipping, all those different containers I can uh, actually configure in my Grafana dashboard. So as you can see, uh, as and when I induce the attack, you know, my um, my average response time is falling down and in due course of time, you should be able to see it is completely gone. And then the same goes with my latency as well. Right, so in this case, my latency actually increases, you know, as, as the chaos engineering attacks are done. So I switch back to my front end servers. I should not be able to see the catalog service up and running. Yeah. And I also see the attack is still happening here. Yeah. So this is a real, this is a live monitoring that we actually do on the, the impact of the failure injections on the different containers. Okay, again, you, you can configure your application business transaction, right? For example, you know, I want to do, I want to monitor a transaction as a whole, uh, you know, that you can configure again using Grafana and Prometheus. Uh, so right now what we've done is an individual um, uh, pod level monitoring uh, is what we've done, but you can actually stitch it together to form an end-to-end -end business transaction and you can monitor uh, your, your transaction level details as well. OK, uh, let me switch it over. So I'll just switch over to the last one hour. So if you look at, you know, this was the previous attack that we did like about half an hour ago. So as you can see, you know, when the attack was done, you know, the, there was uh, zero incoming and outgoing traffic uh, from this catalog pod. And again, you know, when I did this chaos engineering attack, I can see the latency was was high because the front end service was not able to reach to this catalog uh, service at all. So this is the power of observability, right? Um, so you, it's not just enough. Uh, you, you just do a silo chaos engineering experiment, but it is very important that you have an observability platform. Uh, it, it could be a starting point could be a simple Grafana and Prometheus dashboard, you know, which you can use. But as you mature, you know, you will need um, uh, an even more powerful observability platform to monitor your application business transactions. So given that I'll quickly talk about our experience uh, for on a, on a case study where we were able to successfully transform to a failure driven culture for a global fintech leader. Um, so the scope of this engagement was to re-architect uh, a legacy uh, wealth management system to more of a distributed, you know, a, a microservices based cloud native application. Um, 
so you know again the customer had a lot of pain points right you know uh, in this engagement we are talking about 3000 plus distributed microservices architecture and uh, uh, the customer wanted to build a fault tolerant system which can quickly auto heal and quickly recover uh, in case of any failures right basically we are talking about a very low uh, mean time to detect and mean time to recover uh, mttd and mttr so what we did is you know bring in some of the shift lift resilience engineering practices which ramya touched upon earlier like you know uh, working with the enterprise it architect team understanding the application architecture to kind of understand if there are any single point of failures or uh, what is your data redundancy strategy or if there is any auto scaling that is required right so all these different um, uh, architectural level decisions were were made uh, so that your application becomes resilient before even we start the coding, right? And we also brought in the chaos engineering practices. Uh, again, you know, we started with the low blast radius, and then we we started kind of evolving with uh, to the high blast radius as as the system evolved. Now, as I said, you know, this was over three thousand plus distributed microservices. So uh, the major challenge was, you know, how do I quickly isolate and diagnose the failure, right? So in terms of my Grafana dashboard, right? If I have uh, a view of all the list of microservices that are running uh, as one single dashboard. And if there are any failures, say, for example, a payment transaction has failed, I can quickly now go and uh, look at, you know, which particular microservice is actually causing the issue. And I can have an alerting mechanism saying that uh, if my particular microservice goes beyond a specified threshold, right? For example, my latency threshold is, say, 50 milliseconds. And, you know, if this particular microservice is gone, exceeded this particular uh, threshold, I can get a quick alert and notification saying that, this microservice is having a problem, right? So, and, and with chaos engineering experiment, we are actually simulating these kind of failures beforehand so that we have the experience to go and triage these issues pretty quickly. And, uh, and again, you know, to add, add to this complexity, you know, this particular engagement also had a hybrid infrastructure deployment. Uh, this was some of the uh, application workload was deployed on Azure. Some of them were, dis were deployed on a AWS. Some of them were on-premise and the customer had siloed monitoring tools, right? Um, so for on-premise, you know, the customer was using SolarWinds for Azure. It had used, uh, they were using the uh, native Azure monitoring tool like Azure Monitor. So this was kind of, you know, uh, fragmented and, you know, it was siloed. So the, again, the full observability platform that we implemented kind of brought in the monitoring data from all these different sources. And we were able to display it in one unified dashboard. Uh, so that you know we can we can even look at the resource level statistics, right? For example, if a particular node in AWS is kind of um, uh, running beyond the ninety percent CPU utilization, you know we should be quickly able to identify it and get it notified. And the last one is uh, our commitment to the customer was ninety nine point nine nine percent high availability, um, and and you know this is where we brought in the site reliability engineering practices that we touched upon earlier like you know how do i get the wisdom of production incidents right back to my engineering team how can i automate some of the toils so that uh, uh, so that you know there is more time for the engineering team to work on you know newer capabilities right instead of going and debugging these incidents again and again manually uh, so these were some of the best practices that we brought in as part of this engagement Again, uh, as I mentioned, no one size fits all. You know, every customer is different. Uh, every customer needs are different. Um, so what it means that, you know, uh, based on the customer requirement, you know, you need to have the right observability platform uh, to be implemented. Uh, in this case, you know, we had implemented our own custom observability platform, which had the capability to inject, inject both the chaos attacks, you know, uh, at the resource level as well as at the Kubernetes level. Uh, right uh, and these chaos attacks were integrated as part of our continuous integration pipeline so whenever there was a code commit you know we actually started with a low blast um, uh, radius uh, chaos scenarios and we ran them as part of the continuous integration pipeline and we had uh, a regular workday uh, sorry game day scenarios right you know where all the stakeholders were notified beforehand and this was like a fire drill you know that happened uh, where we uh, induced a uh, higher blast radius scenarios um, and uh, all the stakeholders were notified beforehand so that you know they can expect the failures and they can work on triaging them. And 
the observability platform that we uh, implemented, it had the capabilities around the infra monitoring, uh, application performance monitoring, as well as the capacity predictions, right? So we used the AI and ML algorithms, right? So uh, there were a lot of telemetry data that was feeding in from different sources, like, you know, solar winds was giving all the infrastructure monitoring data, uh, Azure Monitor was giving on the Azure related data. AWS CloudWatch was giving all the CloudWatch related data, right? You know, we had actually uh, aggregated all this different data and we implemented the AML algorithm on top of it. And we were able to predict the anomalies beforehand, right? Um, and this is the, 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 and this also served as a key input for our uh, capacity predictions. So tomorrow, with this user load, you know, uh, since this is the uh, X configuration that we have uh, with a peak user load, you know, what will be the likely configuration, right? We were able to predict those capacity um, uh, configurations, you know, beforehand with the power of uh, the predictive algorithms. And finally, this is a conceptual view of our, how our entire observable, observability platform look like. Um, so we had the on-prem server as well as the cloud server. Uh, we were able to do the chaos engineering on both of the servers, brought in the po powerful observability platform with the AML model. We configured them with the alert channel. So if there are any threshold breakages, right? For example, if one of the microservices was exceeding the threshold, we were able to quickly alert it uh, to our alert channels like Slack. Um, and uh, we also brought in the concept of continuous integration, as I said, uh, for continuous chaos injections. And finally, some benefits to quickly talk about. Uh, we were able to reduce 60% reduction in the incidents, predominantly in the uh, infrastructure area um, because of the proactive notification that we were able to achieve uh, and 90% ability to reduce our MTTD and MTTR, right? Because we were able to get the correlated data from different sources uh, and we were able to pinpoint, uh, you know, where your performance issues were, right? You know, we were able to drill down to the microservices level on what was actually causing the performance issues. And in turn, we were able to achieve the high availability, right? Um, of 99.99%. Um, again, some key benefits on we were, there were no disruptions in the past, for the past 10 months, you know, it's been successfully running and uh, a significant improvement in the service availability and durability from an end customer standpoint. Ramya, do you want to add anything on top of this? We are good size. So one one thing is actually uh, the point which I would like to the, the the experimentation what we did right. So actually we we couldn't get the thoughts at a one time right. So we started only with chaos engineering. It didn't work. Actually, we couldn't make all of things work. Then we wanted to bring in the uh, the, uh, the the power of. Uh, SRE at the, the rightmost piece. Again, we had a lot of uh, challenges again. And then we realized, okay, we, unless we have a common observability platform, which is being used, be it for chaos engineering early or for doing it. So I, I think we, we couldn't just like that come to this stage just at one go. It, it have been a lot of trial and error, again, choice of the tool and to justify why we have to bring, develop our own solution, not using the market tool. So there were a lot of study and a lot of, it took a lot of time to make this happen. And we are, we were not to this at in one single point at one go. So that is something, uh, a good, good thing, which I, I think, I, I think we need to share. And in doing all this, the primary challenge, I'm sure you will not be surprised, uh, the primary challenge was more than technical, making people uh, adjusted to this failure culture to transform the people. Uh, there was a, one of the question on SLA, how do you make it happen? So making the people understand of additional responsibilities is a bigger challenge than the technical challenges we actually have to overcome. So that is with that, I think we are we are on time and let, let's just get started with, uh, uh, go on with the next section, uh, Sai. Sure. So before we move on, uh, Ramya and Sai, I uh, just wanted to give an heads up that we only have uh, seven minutes to go for you yeah. people. And we have a couple of questions as well. So if you want, then in that case, uh, we can address the question first and probably after that we can go for a quiz. Or sure. something like that. I think that's, that's, exciting. that's great. So uh, we have a question uh, from Manish. Mahesh, and he is asking like, have you involved in defining error budgets? And can you run through an example how you have defined error budget? So there are a couple of questions. So we'll take one by one. 
So if you uh, can answer first question that have you involved in defining error budgets? Yes, so le let me take this question, right? So basically, if we think of bringing is yeah, I think it, it it requires a lot of org wide acceptance and change, right? So there are many models at which we have been working for many clients. Again, one model didn't fit for all the clients, honestly, which which I say why I'm pointing this out is the maturity level or acceptance level or the ecosystem that is available in the organization decides who has to do it and how it has to be driven. OK, so I'll, I'll give you a quick example for the one of the uh, uh, banking customer way we are working. They weren't. Uh, the business was ready to accept it, but there was nothing happening in place. There was nothing in place, so that gave us a luxury to set up a model where we have set up a governance layer, which make things work. We, we which takes care of all the leadership level changes, the org structure, the emphasizement, the power, getting us the real power. That was the complete. All these strategic problems were taken care by the governance layer. Okay, and we have a bottom up uh, a layer where we have the team who are working in the respective application, the business critical pilots where we embedded a dedicated SRE to bring a focus. OK, so this dedicated SRE consultant worked with the product engineering team to as, as a uh, how do I say so as a change maker, he started working the product engineering team to make things work and definitely as one of the, uh, the question, right? It, it doesn't work the way we expect and the product engineering team doesn't accept it. So that is when you need the power of the governance layer to make things work where at the ground level you can have the, the have the SREs who are part of the each of the team to make things work at a ground level. That is the one way that has really helped us to bring things uh, in place for this customer. Great, so we have a follow up question on that. That Product management have no idea of error visit most of the times. How have you overcome this issue? OK, so it, it is uh, uh, related. It is related to the first question, right? So exactly. uh, Sai, j j go ahead, Sai. I mean, you can take out this question. Sorry, go, go ahead, Ramey. You, you finish up your thoughts. Sure, no so now basically uh, the and as as the governance layer is set up, the, the primary function of SREs has to be defined, right? And what has to go in that the priorities has to be defined. Majority of the organization, they don't set the priorities and uh, a top level push is always the missing factor. So when that push happens and all the rest of piece falls in place and definitely for deciding error budget, Yes, there are multiple personas that have to be involved to make this decision and we had uh, honestly many times it is not just one time many problems just because the way we defined error budget we always ended up over committing and we were having a very small error room and we had to have a lot of things in place. So we have definitely undergone and honestly it comes with the trial and error. OK, so even even if you have an acceptance across all the personas and you bring all the personas together to define, it comes with a trial and error. You you set up an SLA, you see where do you stand, you observe how do you what kind of an achievements you make, relook as a set up a war room, see where do you stand, what kind of a challenges you have and bring the blameless postmortem in. So it is easy for the uh, different personas to work together to define and optimize the, uh, the, the, the targets and derive the uh, uh, error budget accordingly and do not have an error budget policy very stringent from the day one. Start with the small and then as you monitor, you understand where do you stand and then you improvise it. That has been the strategy always that has worked where for clients where they are bringing SRE just because they had too much of operational issues and they want SRE to solve all the problem at one uh, one fortnight or one week. No, that wouldn't happen that way. It takes time and it is more of a technical problem. It is a people related issue. You have to transform people, get acceptance. It takes definitely the time and you need a governance layer to support you to make this happen for you. Cool. Uh, thanks, Ramya, for uh, helping us uh, out with the nice questions and probably sharing some beautiful insights on the questions what our audiences have. Uh, there's one more question uh, that a lot of tools uh, say that they provide observability, but there is still debate on that. And uh, Honeycomb is one of them which provides true observability and a lot of tools doesn't including a uh, Prothemis. So what are your thoughts on that? 
hundred percent, right? So many tools in the market just because they they tell they, they are observable. They are fully full stack. We, we just showed you a slide on what is the expectations from a full stack observability, right? Bring together all dimensions to do a quick correlation to solve a problem. That is the objective, right? So just having capability for log analytics, just having capability, just integrating the alerts and then rising it to rise the service now incident. Uh, it these kind of a siloed capabilities alone will not solve the problem. I can't hundred percent agree. And with observability becoming the hype, there are plenty of tools that are coming every day. Unless you are very clear what is expected, what is the objective you wanted to achieve in the observability? Do not. There is one no no one single tool which can help to make things happen. It is OK. Use at least two different tools which are good in achieving two different things and then use SRE to bring integration to have an automated way of connecting these tools uh, data point to have a correlation analytics, but it is not as an excuse where you use certain tool in the name of observability platform, but you aren't very comfortable to quickly nail down the problem because end of the day your observability is help in, should help you to reduce your NTTR and keep your system availability high. If you're not able to achieve that, then it is the choice of your observability tool is wrong. Explore what is missing and then start bringing additional point solutions or build your own additional utilities that can do analytics with the help of AI. That has been solved many of our problems so far. Thanks, Ramya, for uh, giving again a beautiful insights on the questions of Mahesh. Uh, and you have actually shared a beautiful insights on resilience and reliability testing. Probably every one of us have could, could have gotten detailed information about it, and probably everyone can now relate it uh, to the things what we would be doing in a day in and day out in a, into our organizations. So probably thank you so much again for that. Uh, with this note, I would like to thank you. And if you want, you can run a quiz for a two minutes. And after that, probably we sure. can kick out with the next session. Thanks, Karthik. I think quiz should take five minutes. I think we are we are we should be able to do that. That's it. OK, I request all the audience to join slido.com. Please enter your name, register your name, and then just let's take up the quiz. It has very short 10 questions. We should be done with the next five minutes. Let me give one more second before we start. Sir, do you want to quickly run through? Um, OK, let's go. I think we should be able to finish it in five minutes. Sorry. Okay, that's the right answer. Majority of you said yes, yes. Stress testing helps to break the system outside and only chaos helps you to break inside out. What is the commitment provided by the product development team to the vendor call? Let's wait for all of your answers. OK, that's right. It is SLA. SLO, yes, few people have taken. SLO is an internal target that I said within the product engineering team, right? It is internally uh, said, dealt with the engineering team uh, that is called SLO. What is the permitted error budget? If I say five nines is the availability. Uh, we don't see it on the slide, though. We are not seeing this question. Yeah, I mean, it hasn't refreshed. OK, OK, it is not refreshing quickly. Even for the last question, it took a lot of time to the data. OK, I think it should be, uh, you should be able to see now. It's yes. taking time to refresh, yeah.
What I'm going to do now is it is taking time to refresh. So in the interest of time, I'll skip this quiz and I'll just take you quickly to the questions. Is that OK? So, yeah. in the interest of that. so yes, uh, the error budget is 5.2 uh, uh, minutes of downtime. So that is the permitted error room I have. Most of you have given right answer. So IIS infrastructure as a core is an example for toil automation. We discussed about this. So toil automation is about bringing automation to reduce. So infrastructure as a core is an example for bringing automation to reduce the manual way of dealing with things. Manually doing, uh, creating infrastructure every time I need. Yes, so this is an example where I don't need to create infrastructure manually. I manage it as a code. That's the right answer. Error budget helps to balance the velocity of the release and system reliability. Is it yes or no? We did discuss about it. So what does it take me? Uh, just by having DevOps, it doesn't help me to emphasize on system reliability. There is something which is going to help me to make this smart balancing. And that smart balancing is, yes, that's right. It is error budget, which is going to really control and to take the decision. Which of the below is not a full stack observability tool? We did talk about various observability uh, solutions. Um, App Dynamics, Dynatrace, New Relic, uh, uh, ServiceNow, App Optics, which is not a full stack observability. A full stack observability is expected to have good, good uh, data across all dimensions and capability to correlate and yes the right answer is service now because service now is an instant management tool and it is not a observability tool chaos engineering helps in increasing the mean time to repair mttr so in the starting of the session we have been talking a couple of times so the need uh, for chaos engineering for achieving certain big uh, objective Primarily from an uh, operational standpoint to meet the high availability uh, expectations and reliability. Chaos engineering is a practice which helps me to decrease the mean time to repair a problem. It will not increase. So end of the day, I'm preparing the system. Uh, so I, I'm more prepared to solve a problem. So thereby I decrease the mean time to repair a problem. Which of the following is not a chaos testing? There are various test tools available in the market. Few uh, by cloud native, few open source commercial tools are available. So which among these are not chaos testing? That's right. Simeon Army is from Netflix. Litmus uh, Pumba is an open source tool and AWS as, uh, has a uh, failure injection simulator. These are all chaos engineering tools and JMeter is not a chaos engineering tool. Last but one, which is not a feature of uh, the observability. We talked about what all the dimensions, various dimensions that an observability tool should have capability to pick up the data. We did talk about a, a full stack view I was showing where I was explaining what is in it. If I have to say it is a, a capable of observability. If I say it is a full stack observability, what does it take? OK, the right answer is Application uh, health monitoring and infrastructure monitoring, yes, it is offered by an observability tool, but carrying out failure attacks and load simulation, which is primarily a performance testing tool in this case. So these two cannot be expected by an observability tool. So moving on, the last question, which of the attacks cannot be performed by a chaos testing tool? 
We spoke about various type of attacks that can be triggered. And we did talk about the different blast radius that we need to focus early and late during production uh, when the system is on operation. Right answer is, I think um, it is B and C. Usually business logic level failure attack, it has to be custom created uh, and it cannot be given by a generalized chaos testing tool. And component failures due to high user load, typically it is an outside in a failure use case where it is a performance testing tool that I use to make this happen. So chaos testing tool, infrastructure level, uh, pod level, which is to be the resource level or a state level attacks, bringing down this uh, instances can be done, but not the business logic and component failures. Okay. Here are the top five uh, folks in the leadership board. Adi, Sonu, Mayur, Pankaj, and Praveen. Good show. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hope Thank you, uh, enjoyed the, the session. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Feel free to reach out to us in LinkedIn and just here is the link for GitHub where you could take a man, look at our manual, and do try it out offline. Feel free to reach out to us for any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ramya. Thank you, Sai, for the wonderful session. Thank you so much for your time.